So this is the self-development with tactics. Book. So, today we once again gonna talk about something very specific, because we're gonna talk about Seneca once again, as we've also been talking about him and his essays the past, I think, three days, quite, or two days, ah, three days, quite three days, and, um, yes, I do think that, first of all, his writing is pretty amazing, even though, for me, as a non-native, and as a person that is not really used to it, it can be, indeed, uh, pretty difficult to go through these things, because they're written so... Uh, old, if I can say that, or just antique, or uh, whatever you want to call it. Um, it is a little bit of a difficult thing for me to just go through them from time to time. But yeah, I found another book or another, well, essay by Seneca. I think it is an essay. And it is called De Vita Beata. I've just actually, yes, pronounced this um, Italianish, But no, it is, I think, Latin. And it is about the happiness of life or how to have a happy life, which I think is a really fucking important thing. And this is also why I'm willing to go through it and I'm willing to talk about it. And yes, uh, I think I'm just going to read and go ahead in that way. I just really feel kind of strange sitting there with my not even tank top. Um, but yeah, it is what it is. And I don't care. Seneca, the, Be the Vite de Beata, books 1 to 10. Seneca the Younger was a controversial figure in his own day. As a narrow counselor, at least in his early years, he was not exactly in the best company and he was often criticized as a hypocrite. A denouncer of tyranny, he served a tyrant, attacking those who courted power, he seemed to court power. Criticizing political flatterers, flatterers he was himself often regarded as a political flatterer. Censoring the wealthy, he was nonetheless quite wealthy himself, but it is also the case that much of the criticism arose from those who were politically opposed to him and also the Seneca, and also that Seneca eventually retired to the country to live a quiet life. In AD 65, he was ordered by a paranoid Nero to commit suicide and slit his veins to bleed to death. Posterity would be somewhat kinder to him that than his contemporaries. His works were highly appreciated in the Middle Ages and medieval legend said that he had been converted to Christianity by Saul Paul. The Bevita, uh, the Vita Beata of the Happy Life was written about seven or so years before his death. It was de uh, dedicated to his older brother Gallio. Gallio incidentally is the actual historical link between Seneca and Paul. He is the Gallio of Acts. Um, yeah, whatever. So you can read the Bevita, uh, the Vita Beata online in English in Aubrey Stewart's translation at Wikisource, which is a pretty amazing thing. And I might also be doing so as I've also been thinking about going through On Anger, um, which is a book all about anger management so that we kind of have an audiobook version of it. So I might be working on that. Um, this might be available on not this channel, but I'm going to see. I'm going to see and I'm going to have a look at it. But it's probably not going to be perfect, you know, as so less things that I'm producing, <laughs> to really be honest. So book one, and this is, by the way, some sort of a, a summary, commentary, whatever you want, uh, because I do just want to give you an overview of everything. And I do also myself want to have an overview of everything. And I don't want to go through the whole one right ahead. And yeah. Seneca opens by noting that everyone wants to live happily but has difficult seeing or difficulty seeing what it is in which a happy life consists. Thus, we must be very careful to define what happiness is and then lay out clearly the path to it rather than wandering around aimlessly. The major thing to avoid is just going along with what others are doing or have done. This is perhaps easier said than done. The drive to conform is very strong within us. And yes... It is indeed very strong because we are the social animal. Book two. The question of happy life cannot be determined as if it were a matter of vote. We should ask not what is often done, but what is best to do. Instead of following the herd, we should let the mind find out. And this is a quote. Let the mind find out what is good for the mind. Doing this will get us remarkable results. And yes, which is at my point of view, a little bit of an addition to book one and just don't do what others are doing for the sake of just doing what others are doing. Do what is working for you. Do what is just good for you. And uh, yeah, work from there. And also don't compare yourself to other people. It's just uh, some thoughts in my head. 
basically a message to myself, to be honest, uh, do not compare yourself to other people. Don't do that. And I, I totally believe that it is something that we just naturally tend to do because it is just something that we naturally tend to do, but very important to just not do that because, um, yeah, okay, this is what other people are doing, okay, this is what makes other people happy, and this is what they need, and this is what what they think they need, and stuff like that, but, but you are thinking differently, and you are a different person, and you have different experiences, and you have different thoughts, and you have different lives, and you have different whatever, so... So yeah, it is a not a really recommendable thing to do, but still, I understand that it is something that just we all are doing quite. Book three. We need to find something that does not merely look good in appearance, but which is solidly and adequately beautiful. It is actually quite close to us, but we are like people groping after it in the dark. Seneca knows that he is a stoic, although as a stoic, he must think for himself and not merely follow a prior stoic philosopher. And the key stoic idea is that true wisdom consists in not departing from nature and in molding or conduct according to her laws and models. The happy life then consists in the mind acting according to its own proper nature. So whatever is working for you. Book uh, five, I think, no, four it is. The same idea may be expressed in many different ways. Seneca gives several alternative formulations in this chapter. And these are all quotes. The first one, the highest good is a mind which despises the accidents of fortune and takes pleasure in virtue. Virtue being kind of the uh, most important thing for a stoic quite, something that you should be going for in your life and something that um, that is your happiness quite in life. But I still don't know what virtue actually is. And I think you can also see that, which is amazing. Wait, now you probably see it. Um, goodness, richness, uprightness, decency, good point, good quality, strong point, strong suit, date that she lost her wealth and her virtue in a great city, see virginity, okay, no, I think this is not what I'm, <laughs> what I'm aiming for, merit, advantage, benefit, usefulness, um, yeah, I think it's goodness, rightness, but I like upstandingness, this feels pretty good. The second one is, it is an unconquerable strength of mind, knowing the world well, gentle in its dealings, showing great courtesy and consideration for those with whom it is brought into contact. The third, it is knowledge of good and bad only in the form it has for mind, so that the happy person loves honor and virtue, but despises fortune and pleasure, which seems to also be a stoic principle or virtue, to just not go for pleasure, you know, just not seeking pleasure in whatever it way, uh, in whatever way it might be. The fourth one, it is free, upright, under what undeterred and stable mind, taking honestus, which is nobility or integri integrity, as its one good and turpitudo, baseness or villainous as its one evil. And the fifth, last one, it is and this is a quote again, it is the repose of a mind that is at rest in a safe heaven. Or haven. Heaven. Heaven. I think it's heaven. It's not heaven, like just just this thing just above us. It's not heaven. It's haven. H-A-V-E-N. <laughs> -E so <laughs> fuck that. All of these are essentially the same in the same way that an army is the same army no matter what formation it uses for the march, which is, I think, a very good anecdote or a metaphor. Book five. Uh, we can call someone happy who neither hopes nor fears, but obviously we need to add to this what we need to add to... to but to do this, that for someone to be happy requires that they know what happiness is. The happy life must be founded upon a true and trustworthy discernment. This is the only way to rise above mere slavery to the pleasure of the body. Yeah. Once again, pleasure and not being kind of the optimal thing to go for, uh, but rather something different. Book six. But what of the pleasures? But what of the pleasures of the mind? The same may be said. The mind must be governed primarily by good judgment and not by pleasures. Yes. Book seven. Even those who want to claim that pleasure is happiness or the highest good can only do so by treating virtue and pleasure as linked, Seneca rejects this notion. 
Nothing prevents virtue from existing apart from pleasure. And how can we make sense of the fact that some things seem pleasurable but bad, while others seem good but difficult? Father, even a base the basest of human beings can have pleasures. The two are not linked at all. Virtue is high, exalted and regal, unconquered in what in the fetchable. Pleasure is lowly and servile, stupid, blind, a thing of brothel and tavern. The highest good must be something enduring, but pleasure by its nature is always transient. The highest good must be something enduring must be something long term but yeah indeed actually to be honest like pleasure is something that we are just gaining in uh, minutes or seconds not necessarily over a year of course we can get pleasure out of something over a year but i do think as i'm thinking about it that we just get the pleasure every day for a just certain amount of time you know if i'm just having a new car and i'm just driving it i'm not constantly driving it and i'm also not constantly thinking about it then um, i'm going to be happy about it or i'm going to have this pleasure of having it for um this hour or just two hours or how long i'm just riding it or just how long i'm using it in the day quite but maybe not even, because I mean, if there's some traffic jam, if there's some people that are cutting you off, if there's some some whatever, uh, you might get angry. Even though there's no reason to get angry about this and stuff like that. This is something else that is very stoic. Uh, but yeah, you know what I mean. Book 8. Moreover, bad and base men take pleasure in their wrongdoing. Pleasure should not be the guide by the companion of a good will. If we treat pleasure as primary, it passes. It only has value if it is uh, ancillary to greater things. We should be uncorrupted by external things, ready for any fortune, good or bad. Like the God, we may go forth into external things, but must always return to ourselves and seek harmony in ourselves. We may indeed say that the happy life is conquered of the soul with itself. It feels like that, you know, the uh, process or that process is the goal. And I do want to say like, yeah, it just actually do, does, does make sense. You know, I'm not going to lie. But, but, um, but yeah, you know, it is easily sad. And, but it is just uh, quite difficult to do. Of course, I mean, if you're just, I don't know. I mean, as I'm thinking about it, something that is long-term that is long-lasting that is enduring might be just a really good relationship with somebody with a loved one with uh you know what it is a love relationship whether it is a friendship a brothership yeah <laughs> i don't know if there's even brothership but um but yeah this feels very enduring or it feels that it can be very enduring and also long-term not pleasurable but a long-term good thing book nine but the obvious object that, objection I'm sorry, that will be raised is that we only pursue virtue because we get pleasure from it. While virtue may please, however, this is not the same as to say it, say it is sought for the pleasure. Just as a tile field may allow for lovely wildflowers without being tiled for that reason. Quite, yeah. Virtue is not sought for anything beyond itself because it is, by its very nature, complete in itself. It is hope. Uh, it is wholeness of soul, it makes no sense to ask why we should or would pursue virtue as our highest natural end. There is no... F what? It makes no sense to ask why, okay, we would pursue virtue as our highest natural end. There is no further end to which it would be rational to subordinate it. What we seek from virtue is virtue, because virtue is her own reward. And there is a Latin quote there, ipsa pretium sui. How could it be otherwise? Question mark. Is this like the translation? I hope so. If someone identifies a life as enduring, strong, prudent, sublime, healthy, free, harmonious, and lovely, what rational person would then follow this identification with the question, what would make someone want that? What, what would make someone want that? So if someone identifies a life as enduring, strong, prudent, sublime, healthy, free, harmonious, and lovely, what rational person would then, yeah, Indeed, and I mean, if your life is great, <laughs> why would you ask, like, you know, what, what makes you want that? And this is actually a very, I gotta have to say, like, this is a very good way to get people to be like, well, you know, virtue is just what I want to have, because, because, yeah, of course, you know, if 
if you're just uh, if you're healthy, if you're free, if you're prudent, if you're strong, if you're whatever, you know, why would you even question that? You know, it's it's not really about like just what virtue is or whether virtue is the right thing to go for. It is like okay, this is virtue, and so why wouldn't you go for it? It's actually very very tricky. You know, it's it's um, <laughs> well done. <laughs> Book ten. The point of the position is perhaps more to insist that the pleasurable life in itself evolves the honorable life. But this does not do any better. It's clear enough that vicious people have plenty of pleasure and precisely one of these things, what one of the things virtue does is discriminate among different pleasures. Pleasure is for use and not decision. The reasonable thing is not to do anything for pleasure. Yeah, but rather to use it is not to do anything for pleasure, not doing anything for pleasure. But it is very difficult. It is very difficult. Fuck. Because, I mean, uh, recreation, this is the just... Well, okay, of course, if you think about recreation, then this is the only reason why you're having sex. But, you know, most often it's about pleasure. Um, I'm eating something because I can fuel my... I can... Yeah. (laughs) I can fuel my body... But I could also eat something out of pleasure. I could also eat something just because it feels good and I like to eat and whatnot. So I think we indeed can somehow change the way we think about things to make us do things uh, not because of pleasure but because of some other reasons. But what it is is then really indeed what we internally are doing or if it is just a layer above our subconscious mind or, and our unconscious mind... Um, which is the conscious mind and just a layer of okay a layer of reason quite and of imaginary reason that uh, is actually not the case then just down below quite if you just know what I'm referring to um, it's difficult to to just say it's difficult to to argue quite I'd have to say that but yeah uh, this is actually the end of the episode so I Wish you the best health of happiness and all the success and also hope that you're going to remind yourself and you're going to be remembered, which basically means your legacy and basically means just being a nice person and then being remembered as a nice person. Three other questions that I'm having for you are, why are you here? What are you trying to change and what is bothering you the most? These three questions are hopefully going to show you your purpose and maybe even a business idea, which is a pretty fucking cool thing. One other question that I'm having for you is, what could you particularly say to another person that is really going to change their life. Because I totally believe that we all can say something. I totally believe that we all can just spit some words that are going to change how somebody's thinking about something, how somebody's just dealing with something, how somebody is it's just, uh, you know, in, in which mood somebody is. You know, give somebody a compliment and they're probably not going to be that unhappy anymore. You know, unless it is a fucked up compliment like, okay, you did this very well. It's not good. It's not very specific. It's not very just... Um, it's just not very good <laughs> but yeah with that being said thank you very much from the bottom of my heart i hope that i've been able to just share some things that were of value and yeah i'm hopefully gonna see you the next time bye bye